Hey there, art nerds. Happy Lunar New Year. This is the year of the water rabbit. And I held a poll over on Twitter as well as on the community tab with two different concepts and asked which you guys wanted to see. A Yaru inspired rabbit actually she's more of a hare or our lop-eared sweet lolita inspired rabbit you guys voted for the lop-eared so we're going to be inking and coloring her with alcohol markers today i'm gonna have the line arts for both available on my patreon so if you're one of my amazing patrons you guys can color along with me if you want to there's going to be a black and white version as well as a colored ink version depending on your preferences and i'm going to be coloring with a variety of markers today so i encourage you guys to color with the markers of your choice that you like coloring with so I'm working with a variety of Blick Studio, Copic, and Prismacolor markers, and I'm going to be inking with Tombow Furunosuke brush pens. I'm also going to be using a little bit of white gouache at the end, and all of this was done on Strathmore's Bristol paper, the smooth finish, which I happen to really like for markers. So grab your favorite coloring implements and let's get started on coloring this lop-eared sweet Lolita for Lunar New Year. Initially, my sketch was done digitally in Photoshop. That's just the program that I happen to be the most comfortable with sketching in. I printed it out using my Epson printer and I penciled it using a fairly hard lead onto our Bristol. Before I start inking, I kind of made a list of what colors I want different things to be. This allows me to go ahead and ink with confidence because I've already done that thinking and that visualizing beforehand. Hand. I'm working primarily with the regular sort of classic Tombow Furenosuke brush pens as well as some of the neon ones. I thought I might have a chance to use some of the pastel ones and honestly I just chickened out. The fact that they have a slight opaque quality to them made me a little bit worried that they would appear kind of muddy or murky as we markered on top of them. So the whole point of a colored line art like this is to kind of blend in with the marker illustration. I know some people will go ahead and marker over their pencils for the longest time. I thought that that would ruin my markers. I still kind of think there's a good chance the graphite can ruin your markers. So I do acknowledge that some people will just go ahead and marker on top of a penciled sketch. That's still not really for me. That said, I do have some tutorials on a disappearing line art trick where we use colored leads and then marker on top of that and the marker melts the lead slightly, but it doesn't seem to have any kind of, you know, detrimental effect on the marker markers themselves. So I'm using a variety of colors to achieve our colored line art. Basically, I select sort of my base color. That's the local color. And then I use another color, usually something a little darker and a little cooler to kind of ink in the shadows for it. Sometimes I get really fancy and I do a highlight, a mid light and a low light, but it's really up to you how you want to approach it. Like I said, though, if you're one of my patrons, I already have the line art, both a black and white version and a color version of the line art available for you guys. If you're going to marker along with me and you want to use something that's marker safe, I would recommend taking it to a place like Office Max or Office Depot and printing it out on your paper of choice using their toner printer, unless you have a toner printer, in which case you can do it yourself. And if you want to work at a smaller version, cardstock is a very, very affordable way to be able to do this without needing to buy a specialty paper. I'm using the good tier of Strathmore. I think it's the 300 series for this because I found that when it comes to my marker pieces, their 500 series and their 300 series, it doesn't really make a lot of difference for what I'm using it for. So here are our finished inks. I'm going to allow them to cure overnight before I erase them. So this is the marker swatching stage. As you guys can see, I have a variety of markers. I've already kind of like pre-selected some of the ones that I felt would be the most promising. And now I'm swatching them on another piece of Bristol. It's really important that when you're swatching markers, you try to swatch on the same kind of paper, if not a scrap of the paper that you're using, because that's really going to give you 
the best idea for how those colors are going to look on that paper. Different papers can affect your markers differently. So it's just an easy way to make sure that what you see is what you get. And I do want to put out a reminder because I've seen a lot of people talking about how much they hate alcohol markers. You can't trust the cap to be an indication of the color inside. You really have to swatch it and you really need to swatch it on the paper that you're working on. I'm not gonna argue with you whether or not you should or shouldn't hate alcohol markers. There's a lot to love and also a lot to dislike, but that's one tip that if that's the reason you don't like alcohol markers, it might make a difference. So I'm gonna list the colors that I use for this tutorial in the description, but like I said, I'm using a really wide variety of alcohol markers. I'm not like brand specific. So it's really catered on what I happen to have and what I happen to like. So they're just suggestions. If you're coloring along with me, feel free to use the markers that you have and the markers that you enjoy using. I am using alcohol markers over water-based markers because for the most part, when it comes to markers, I do prefer alcohol markers. I don't find that water-based markers really handle the same way at all. They're a very different sort of creature and they don't really blend in the same way. And with alcohol markers, you can get these really saturated colors, these really saturated blends that I thought would be really nice for this illustration. So I know some of you guys have asked for more water-based marker tutorials. Keep asking, I will get there eventually. I do actually have some on the channel already. So make sure you do a little bit of digging for that if you're looking for some existing water-based marker tutorials. But I just kind of wanted to explain my rationale why I'm going with alcohol markers today and not necessarily water-based markers. And here's a close-up of the colors that I used as well as um, how, kind of my decision-making process for how I select colors. The strikethroughs mean I'm not going to use these. I put them aside in a separate container just in case I do find that they would be handy. And I also number some of them. The numbers indicate the order that they're going to be used in the tutorial. This is really more of a reference for me. This part isn't super necessary. It's not like we need to stretch our illustration, but I am going, I did want some nice crispy borders on this one. So I'm using some artist masking tape. I think it's like Nichiban. I'm applying it to my arms so that when I remove it from the paper, it doesn't super adhere and tear up the paper. And I'm also taking care not to fold it over this time because in the past, when I folded it over on the paper so that it wouldn't stick to my tabletop, it ended up being way harder to remove. This does end up kind of sticking to my tabletop. It is a little bit annoying. So if you have a thinner masking tape that you want to use for borders, that could be a way to go. So here are the markers that I'm using today. They're in an order, <laughs> not like a hundred percent perfect order of how I'm going to use them, but for each individual color set, they are in order of how I'm going to use them with the lightest colors being toward me. I'm also going to move the colors that I don't need off to the side to give me some room to actually work. I know it's not as visually appealing, but it is a lot easier for me to actually have room to do what I want to do. So I'm going to start with the egg shaped sky background. I didn't actually pencil or ink that in. I wanted to leave it in lighter and also see how I felt about about working with just the blue lines. And I feel like it worked really well. And I'm probably going to do more kind of lineless printed line art stuff in the future. That means I don't have line arts to share with my patrons, which is one of the reasons I haven't done it yet. But if we can figure out a good system, I could always share the sketch and they could work along with me from that. So this has been recorded in hyperlapse, hence the weird shift in color because I'm just doing a background fill. I'm not even being particularly careful about it. I'm gonna do like three layers of color on this background. So I'm really just trying to establish that background color early. 
Bristol, particularly Strathmore Bristol, is a really thirsty paper for markers. It doesn't have like a surface coating that kind of prevents the markers from soaking in. So I've joked before about it being kind of a marker killer. If you get some color in an area you don't want it to be, you can use the colorless blender to just kind of blend it back to the back of the page. So I'm gonna go in and do my next layer. I think it is my next darkest color, but it honestly could just be the same color over again. It really kind of depends on how you want to build up and develop your color and how you want to minimize streaking. I have a lot of different techniques that I use to minimize streaking, including using 99% isopropyl rubbing alcohol to kind of help hide all the streakiness, but that can cause the colors to kind of blow into other areas or blow out. And I didn't want them to bleed into the rabbit girl in this instance. So I decided instead to do more layers of marker. So as a marker artist, I happen to prefer really soft blends and transitions. So that's why I happen to tend to go for thirstier papers that are really going to allow for those softer blends. But different marker artists have different preferences. So it's really a your mileage may vary. And I'm not trying to tell you what will or will not work for you. I'm just telling you guys what does work for me. And honestly, this part was hyperlapsed, but this whole video has been time-lapsed several times. I spent about two days working on this illustration, well, working on the marker part of this illustration. I spent one day inking it and um, a couple of days working on the sketch. So I want there to be a white picket fence in the background, but I don't want it to compete too much with the sort of blue sky in the background. So I'm using some cool grays to kind of block in the base color of the fence. I don't want it to be left white. That would just feel strange. So I'm using like C1 and C3, and then I'm going to use a neutral color to do kind of a wood grain pattern on the fence itself. So the trick to working on these thirstier papers, if you don't want something to be blown out, if you want kind of those crispy details, let it dry first and then go over it with your marker and you're going to get a much sharper color delineation. So here's a little close up on how I'm doing the wood grain. It is just really, really simple sort of brush strokes, really light handed just to kind of give the implication of wood. Then I'm going to start on the grass in the background and I wanted it to be, so there's going to be a lot of like bluish greens, minty greens in this. And I wanted something that would really kind of pop and she wouldn't get lost in it. So I'm going with yellowish greens for the grass. And part of me kind of wishes I hadn't inked the grass in the background because it works so much better without those inks. But again, I wanted to be able to share this on Patreon so that people could color along with me. So that's kind of the choice that I made. So I am working primarily with, like I said, Copics, Prismacolor, and Blick Studio brush markers. Those are some of my favorite, slightly higher end. I don't know that I would call the Blick Studio brush higher end. They're great, but they're not expensive markers. Um, and the, one of the reasons for this is while I like Ohuhu markers okay, they are very prone to like blowing out and bleeding all over the place. And that wasn't really the look that I was going for here. So next I'm gonna start establishing some of the other whites, the not fence whites in the background. So the lace, the whites of her eyes, the pearls on her dress, that sort of thing. And I'm using really, really light blues for this, giving them a little bit of a chance to dry and then kind of not covering the whole thing all over again, but just the areas as they kind of go into the fabric. And I know that's kind of hard to see because these are really tiny details. One of the reasons I do this so early on is that if I wait till the end, sometimes the colors can kind of blur into it and it can be way harder to get those colors in without it turning muddy. And depending on what I'm coloring with alcohol markers, I'll usually do like three to four colors to kind of build up what I'm doing and to get that intensity. And I do try to use each marker as much as I can because you can get about three levels of color, three levels of saturation. 
um, especially on these thirstier papers. So to start off the skin, I wanted to try something I've seen other artists do where I, I'm using a bluish violet for this. I should have gone a little warmer in terms of color because it kind of deadens the skin, but I am adding in the skin tone shadow first and then markering on top of it. And with the really light colors, I'm not going into the skin tone shadow color too much. So something else I noticed while working on this tutorial is that a lot of my Copics are like all crusty and dead and I don't use them that infrequently and I store them properly. If you guys saw the short about that, you can kind of see what I'm working with. Usually that happens with darker colors, not so much with lighter colors. I know how to salvage the markers, although it is time consuming and a, a bit of a pain to be really frank. But the part that really bothers me the most is that a lot of these markers had recently been refilled and now now they're kind of dry like with the e triple zero you guys saw and that leads to a lot of smearing and it also leads to a lot of streakiness so i'm wondering if i'm doing this in january we've had our heater on for a few months i wonder if it just kind of dried out my markers in a way that since in the summer we're air conditioning that wouldn't necessarily be the same problem let me know if you are also experiencing these problems and if you have a theory as to why so you guys can kind of see how some of those lighter colors end up kind of deadening with my choice of skin shadow color. Like I said, I really should have gone with a warmer color for that. And I'm really trying to leave the white of the page still visible on her skin tone just because in this instance with this set of colors that I selected for her skin tone, it can tend to read as kind of a softer, more gentle, almost like a watercolor-esque effect. I like to utilize different techniques when I'm rendering different things. So this is not a universal, it's just what I chose to do for this particular illustration. So once I get about two, two and a half, layers in of the skin tone, I'm going to start adding in the first layers of blush. I'm using a really light color for the blush here and that way I can kind of extend it across her face. I'm also using the blush on like anywhere the skin crosses over skin, the palms of her hands, the tips of her fingers, her elbows when visible underneath her neck, those kind of areas. Switching over to a slightly darker color now for our blush. And this is something that I'm going to kind of keep going back and revising and adjusting as we add our colors. So basically, I have a pretty good idea of what I want for this illustration in my head, but I'm going, I'm open to adjusting and revising things as we color in other things and I see how the contrast looks and as the marker colors dry and I decide, oh, I need to fix this or I need to blend that out. So every marker illustration and every every watercolor illustration is very kind of fluid in terms of, you know, whether or not I'm actually finished with an area. So when I am doing marker illustrations, it's very different from when I'm doing watercolor illustrations. With watercolor, I like to kind of block everything in and kind of work on all aspects of the image at the same pace, saving the details for last. Whereas with markers, it is very, do this area, do then, then do that area, then do the next one. So now we're starting in with the eyes and I want like a really soft kind of shoujo manga-esque effect. So I didn't opt to ink in the irises. I'm markering that in instead. And I wanted it to be just really kind of light and gentle. I also wanted her to have kind of a lighter, like a vanilla color was in my notes. Sort of hair color for this. Not really a real, I guess that would be like ash blonde. Um, it ended up going a little bit darker than I'd kind of planned, but... Um, I also wanted something kind of soft and neutral since we have so many really saturated colors going on with her dress. So with these larger marker illustrations, I've gotten really into doing kind of like open eyelashes, as you guys can see, and then being able to utilize markers to color them in. And I feel like that 
kind of soften things because you don't have as much contrast um, and in a really good way though and it also allows me to introduce additional color up there even if I just fill it with like browns and blacks it's still kind of a softer technique and typically I keep my eyelashes really simple it makes it easier for me to color and a little more challenging for me to like mess up if I you know if I did like a bunch of eyelashes my arthritis would nope out on me and lock up my hand and I just wouldn't be able to do them consistently so it simplicity has its merits for sure so I wanted her ears to be a darker brown than her hair but I am going to use some of the lighter colors from her hair to kind of start us off so that it all feels like it makes sense and like it kind of works together and I was actually referencing I've been referencing lop-eared rabbits a lot for this one obviously since she is a lop-eared rabbit but I was also referencing lop-eared rabbits while rendering this as well to make sure that I kind of got like the color transitions right because even though this is like obviously a fantasy character I still wanted the elements that I'm using to feel right I also heavily referenced Sweet Lolita fashion for this as well although way back in the day I did have several friends who were part of this culture and I've always like really loved and appreciated the dresses although I do feel like this dress is kind of tending Daisy Kingdom because that's what I grew up wearing rather than necessarily Lolita. I'm fine with it either way. I just didn't want any, you know, hardcore L Lolitas in the audience watching this and judging me for my fashion choices. You know, as a child of the 80s, I grew up with the giant dresses and the giant brim hats. And I guess I just have to bring that into it. So for this outfit, since she is a rabbit girl, I wanted to do something very rabbit themed. So I went really like carrots, which are not actually very good for rabbits. So I didn't want to lean too heavily on the carrots, but it is also something that people heavily associate with rabbits due to Bugs Bunny. But I also leaned in with like the clover. And then since it's Lunar New Year, I wanted to kind of do images of luck. So um, there's like a lot going on here that now that I'm like looking at it with a more critical eye I'm like that doesn't make as much sense as it did at the time because we're really like crossing the cultural streams here but I guess I could claim that it was um my take on Lunar New Year as somebody with Irish heritage but I, I don't know I don't want to like make too many excuses for it it really feels more Easter then it feels Lunar New Year so maybe I'll offer this as like an Easter postcard or like a springtime postcard so I wanted to go with a mint, lavender, and like really light peachy orange kind of coordinate. So um, that's where the kind of thinking about what colors you want to use and like write for me, because I don't have strong visualization skills, I have to write it down. Um, I I've talked about having started out as a writer and being a writer who taught herself how to draw or learned how to draw using the internet. So um, I don't necessarily have the strongest visualization skills, but if I can get it into writing, I can work with it. So that's typically what I try to do, especially if a project's going to take a while or I have to set it aside and come back to it later, is I try to take notes on what I have in mind for it. And fortunately, I do have several like really minty light green colors that kind of make this work. And I also wanted to start tending into like the blues. Um, some of these are blue greens as well, just because like Copic and Prismacolor's systems don't make as much sense to me as you'd think they would. So I have them organized in a way that makes sense to me. So um, if that's another tip if you're like struggling to use your alcohol markers, just organize them in a way that makes sense to you. Don't try to force the color systems. Again, you can't really rely on the color caps and different colors are going to look different on different papers. So swatching is really more reliable than trying to lean on the color families that they list. And you guys will see, I also switch really frequently between marker brands like Copic and Prismacolor and Blick. Uh, I find that they all work really well together and that's one of the metrics when I'm reviewing alcohol markers I'm always kind of looking at is how well do these markers play with the markers that I already have because realistically you're going to have kind of a mishmash of markers especially since different brands have different strengths different brands have different colors that they do well and some brands have like just massive gaps in what they have to offer. Like Copic's yellows are very specific yellows and don't work well for hair, for example.
Another example of this is Copic is really pretty weak when it comes to purples and lavenders. I'm using the blue violets that I have, but I've also pulled from Blick as well as Prismacolor. This was an area where I realized like, I really need more markers in this color family because I kind of, I won't say I like really struggled, struggled with this, but there were areas, especially like the bottom part, the scallop part with the clovers, where I just didn't have the in-between colors that I really wanted to be able to indicate shadow in the way that I wanted to. I was able to make it work, but it was still not quite what I wanted. Also, I was hoping for like a more saturated sort of lavender, and this is so pale and so gray. It just wasn't really what I was looking for, but um, I know Prismacolor has some better options in that area, and I do have several Prismacolors in that area, but I do wish they would expand their color line even more. I know they don't have like a lot of interest in doing that since they've been acquired by Rubbermaid, but yeah, I can dream, I can, I can hope. But basically my procedure for this is simple. We start with kind of just a basic fill of the color so that we have a basis to work with. That's also gonna help prevent some of the streaking later on. Then we move on to our next darker color. I'm doing a fill with that one as well because I really wasn't that sat, sat, wow. I really wasn't that satisfied with the saturation I was able to get from the first color. And it was also just too gray and too light to really be useful here. So I'm going over it with a second darker color. I did leave some highlights kind of in the pinstripes at the top of her jumper, but not a whole lot. Lick has a little bit more when it comes to good yellows and purples and they've been adding to their marker line. It was like originally 120 and it's been expanding. So I have hope that they will continue to add colors as people request them or need them. I switched over to Blick be able to be able to get kind of the lavender that I wanted. It's still really muted for what I had in mind. I had like a really kind of warm lavender in mind. But then again, that would have like led this way more into Daisy Kingdom territory than it already is. But I'm just doing the shadows and then blending it back out with the Copic marker and kind of working back and forth with this because like I said earlier, there are some areas where I just don't have like a good in-between color to make those splits make sense. So it's kind of a lot of like, Blending it out, seeing how it looks, giving it another coat, seeing how it looks. A lot of like back and forth kind of trial and error. But I point this out because a lot of making art is back and forth trial and error. And a lot of artists, when they're making tutorials or classes, they'll do a demo version first, figure out all the hiccups and then do like the version that they teach and I have a lot of respect for those artists when I'm teaching like in person I'll do that but I hate doing that for YouTube I hate doing the same thing multiple times under the exact same scenario I do it when I'm teaching classes because honestly anything almost could happen when you're teaching classes so it's really good to have that demo already prepared but when it comes to YouTube I really don't mind showing you how I work through the process and what the thought process looks like because I really want to encourage you guys to make your own art and troubleshooting, problem solving, self critique, that's all part of making your own art. And I hope that if I can like demonstrate the process and normalize it, it'll make it a little bit easier to take that step and to understand that all artists feel doubt about their art. Lots of art goes through a weird, ugly phase where you're either too saturated with what you've been working on and you need a break or it's just not done enough yet and you need a break, usually a break is the solution or the colors haven't really dried. They haven't really settled onto the paper or the paper like with Shizen and Stonehenge Aqua is all open and you need to let it dry and let the paper fibers close to really be able to tell what's going on. So I applied a layer all over kind of on the 
bottom third of the dress in the blick color and I really wanted like there to be like a lighter lavender top part and a darker lavender bottom part to kind of introduce some contrast to it this is another way that it kind of veers into the daisy kingdom and I'm really trying to build up that dark lavender but this is another area where I just don't with all the markers that I have I just don't have a good in-between split from the Prismacolor that I'm going to use to add shading to this to the Blick Studio marker. And I'm trying to build it up as much as I can. But as you guys will see, and this is one of the lighter of their lavenders that wasn't too light to be used. Um, and it's still kind of too dark for what I'm trying to use it for. So either I need to get myself over to David's and start swatching and find some good in-between colors or we really need some good lighter purples from these marker companies. They've got lots of good darker pur purples, especially Prismacolor, but not really a lot of really good lighter purples, which is a shame because these lighter purples are so good for adding shadow, for adding shading, for adding contrast. They are really useful in that regard. So they're not just good as purples as a color in and of itself, but they're a really good sort of shadow tone. So I am using that Prisma color, kind of medium-ish bluish purple, and I'm trying to kind of imply some shading here, and I'm trying to do it really lightly and feathering it so it'll be easier to blend out, but it ends up just making this look kind of like satin, and satin is, uh, especially super shiny satin would be a no-go for this kind of aesthetic. So I'm also trying to blend it back out and kind of disguise it. I wanted to be able to get the shadows of it, but it wasn't really working. So I decided to just let it sit, see how I think about it and move on to blocking in the carrots. And for the carrots, I wanted like kind of a fakey candy orange, if you guys know what I mean something peachy and more pastel rather than like a really in your face orange we're going for a really pastel palette here for the most part and i actually pulled out some Kurt color and neo picos because they had more of what i was looking for and that's another reason we swatch the cap for this marker is like a nice russety orange but what's in the marker is almost like a day glow orange if you don't apply some base layers underneath to tone it which is what i did i went with kind of like a yellowy orange or a orangey yellow as my base color and that means all those weird neon oranges that i put on top of it are going to skew a little bit more orange than fluorescent if that makes sense so I also applied kind of like a really russet blit color and I'm trying to blend that back out with our Neo Pico. And then it's on to doing the green ruffle. And I kind of held that out because I wasn't sure if I wanted to go really dark with it or if I wanted to leave it kind of light to match all the mint that's going on. So I decided to go with the mint because it's gonna be kind of like a nice interim color and we have lots of little areas where I'm gonna use the darker greens like on the shamrocks and on the carrots. So that's another thing, like even though I had kind of a color plan in mind, as I'm working towards those smaller details, I am able to add in more contrast because that's gonna help things kind of pop. Like everything isn't going to just be the same saturation. It isn't just going to be the same kind of lightness. We are gonna have some darker areas to help draw in attention and to help draw in contrast.
So since we've got kind of a country vibe going on here, I decided to lean into that. So I'm doing kind of like a little bit of a stripe, not quite a gingham, not quite a plaid on her bow and on the ribbon that's towards the bottom of the dress. So I went with a darker green. I did my stripes going one direction, gave them a chance to dry, did them going the other direction. And that's going to allow us to get kind of like a nice secondary color since they've dried, they'll actually layer on top of each other. They weren't quite as dark as I'd really wanted. So I'm also gonna go over just kind of the, the area where they overlap and I'm going to do another darker color of that, but I'm gonna give it a chance to dry and kind of keep working on adding some depth and some shadow, leaving just a little bit of rim lighting in a lot of instances to our shamrocks and our clovers and our carrots. At this point, I've been working on this piece for several hours in the evening. I really thought it was going to be finished at this point and I was getting tired. My arthritis was acting up. So I decided like once I finished kind of just touching everything up that I visibly could see needed adjustment that I was going to come back to it the next day and do the finishing touches. So after it kind of cured, dried, whatever, marinated overnight, I decided to go ahead and remove the tape borders. You guys can see it leaves us with some really nice crispy borders and working with an artist masking tape and adhering it to my skin first means it wasn't too adhesive. This is when I decided to make a lot of adjustments to really not rework things, but add more contrast, try to build up the colors a bit better, try to make the shading clearer. Since I'm working with so many pastels, I felt like I really lost a lot of the sort of volumetricness you can get. I also went back in with the Blick and really extended the blend on that purple to kind of try to make it a little bit less noticeable. I also went back in with that purple to add in some additional shadows and I've also continued working and adding layers to the carrots to kind of build up the contrast. Basically I felt like it looked kind of flat when I came back to it and I wanted to add some more contrast shading and value to it to make it just look a little more shiny, make those that contrast pop a little bit more. So with these sort of colored line arts, you might notice that your work does look a little bit muddy. You've lost some of that contrast. So you can always go back and re-ink it, add some of that shading back in. And one of the cool things about re-inking is you can just re-ink the areas that need that additional contrast or need that additional clarification. You don't have to re-ink the whole thing. After re-inking, I went in with some white gouache to add our highlights and I decided to use this as an opportunity to try a trick that I've been seeing other marker artists using. Basically, you can apply like a white, it could be a white gel pen, a white brush pen, it could be white gouache, 
you apply that first as like highlights and then you marker on top of it and what you end up getting is in those areas where you applied the white first there's a little bit of a resist so it makes the color appear lighter than the surrounding areas because it doesn't get to soak into the paper and I thought that would be kind of a fun technique to try for this but we're kind of starting out with like the basic highlights the highlights on the pearls the highlights on the eyes that sort of thing I also wanted to try doing some like wispy hairs so I was holding basil at this point and he was running all up and down my arm so it was a little bit difficult to get the kind of brush control and wispiness that I needed so what I will do and I'll demonstrate that in a moment is with white gouache one of the nice things is as long as it's not dry you can use water and kind of relift it and then repaint it you can also use water to kind of clean some areas up so that it's you know, if it got out of hand, if it blobbed out on you, you could clean that up so that it's not as noticeable. It, it's really pretty flexible and it's one of the reasons I prefer it for these kind of corrections over say like Copic Opaque White or like using a white gel pen or using a white brush pen at this point in time because it's just easier to make modifications. And now, after many hours of work, clocking in at a little longer than I'd hoped for this to be, but still not too bad, we have our finished Lunar New Year Lop-Eared Rabbit. If you're looking for more in-depth alcohol marker advice, tutorials, or tips, I've got a bunch of tutorials on how to use alcohol markers here on the channel. I also have done some live streams where I use my markers live for you guys, and I will be doing a follow-up tutorial with our Gyaru inspired hair Lunar New Year illustration. That is such a tongue twister to say. So if that sounds exciting to you if you saw it in the community tab and you want to see me actually work on it keep an eye out for that I wanted to get this one out though before Lunar New Year so that you know just to kind of celebrate just to do something kind of festive I, I don't hit every holiday I don't even try to hit every holiday but there's some that I'm like you know what I want to make a piece of art for this one and since Lunar New Year is animal themed that always speaks to me and I always want to make a little something to celebrate Lunar New Year with you guys. So I hope you guys had fun hanging out with me. I hope you leave feeling inspired. And don't forget, if you're one of my patrons, you will have access to this line art as a black and white and colored version that you can print out and color along with me. These are most of the colors that I use for the illustration today. If you want to use this palette as inspiration. Again, I want to encourage you to use your own markers that you have. Don't feel like you got to like go out and buy stuff. But if you do feel like something I talked about today would be beneficial or helpful to you guys, I will have the colors listed out in the description as well as the materials used in this tutorial linked out as well. If it comes from Amazon, that is an affiliate link. I do see a little bit of money from that. If it comes from literally anywhere else, I don't see a dime from that. So um, if you wanna help support the channel, I'd appreciate it if you use the Amazon affiliate links when it's something that you're interested in. You can also support the channel by joining me at Patreon at patreon.com slash soup. I had so much fun coloring this and I really love how she turned out. She just turned out so cute. Even though it took a little bit longer than I kind of thought it would, I'm really happy with the results. <laughs> 